This murder case was bizarre and surreal, perfect tabloid fodder. No newspaper editor alive could resist a headline like Lesbian Prostitutes Decapitate and Dismember Transvestite Pro Wrestling Truck Driver. Beneath it all, however, the tale is even sadder than it is twisted. The undoubtedly horrific, inexcusable crime centred on one lonely man's desire for friendship and acceptance. John Joanne Lillicrat was a cross-dressing truck driver and professional wrestler who had taken two women, Donna Casagrande and Nicole McGuinness, into her home in an attempt to help them with their drug addiction. The pair later turned on Joanne in the most horrific way, stabbing her to death for cash, hacking the body to pieces and defleshing each segment. They scattered her remains in the victim's beloved strawberry patch and went on to dump pieces of the torso in several different locations across Adelaide, including a rubbish bin for the head and arms, which they then set alight. Because she didn't strike the fatal knife wounds, Donna Casagrande was convicted of manslaughter and received a 10 year minimum sentence. In November 2011, she was released on parole, serving only 10 years for the brutal murder and gruesome dismemberment of another human being. Then, just three months later, she was charged with theft, deception and trespass offences and was jailed for a further three years and four months. Once more free to walk among us, Casa Grande came under the police spotlight again just last year in 2019 when her brother Joseph went missing. The 51-year-old father of two was reported missing after failing to pick up his son from school. Casa Grande admitted that in the lead up to his disappearance, she had argued with her brother's wife over their late father's estate. Donna explained, I just wanted to have a life like they have. Joseph's body was discovered a month later inside a tent in a remote camping spot. Police say the death was not suspicious. Now, after serving her sentence of 18 years for her part in Joanne Lillicrap's murder, Nicole McGuinness has applied for her shot at parole. Joanne's brother, Ron Lillicrap, wants her to stay in jail, saying the sentence she was given is not the same as the life sentence we have. I cannot imagine how anyone could mentally be able to commit that crime, let alone physically. Ron believes they deserved more of a punishment than any court could impose. He said, I feel angry and cheated. Here is Joanne's story. John Lillicrap, a truck driver and pro wrestler, moved into his home on Norton Street, Angle Park in 1993. Violence was common in the area, with one resident saying, it's best to keep to yourself around here. Initially, the locals called him Tex because he wore large cowboy hats, but soon they got to see the woman behind the man. Lillicrap had taken up cross-dressing two years before his arrival. One would think that he would have experienced enormous difficulties with his neighbours, but nothing could be further from the truth. He felt most comfortable when surrounded by his peers at the park's community centre, just a few kilometres from his home. He considered them part of his extended family and volunteered many hours of his time driving the centre's free bus service. The African, Vietnamese and Indian communities in the area looked to him for advice, help and support. 
He entertained them by taking part in professional wrestling bouts, playing both the hero and the villain for the crowd's benefit. Above all else, he insisted everyone call him Joanne. So that is how I will address him from this point on. His brother Ron said he wasn't your average bloke, but he helped people and he was a worthwhile member of the community. If anyone needed help, he would be there. The people at the Parks Community Centre thought the world of him. He found a place to belong there, something that was missing from other areas and times in his life. And while I wasn't always close to him, if something were to happen, I would have been there for him. But at 50 years of age, looking the part of a woman and being tacitly accepted by his neighbours was not enough. Lillicrap felt his life was one of solitude and he went further and further afield, seeking what he felt would be true acceptance and the understanding of those like him who shared his outlook and beliefs. It was during a trip to Sydney in 1996 that he met Donna Lee Cassegrand. Born in Addington Hospital, New South Wales in 1970, Cassa Grand was the youngest of nine children. Her father was a foreman at a sheet metal factory. Her mother worked until she lost a hand in an industrial accident. In reports later tendered before the Supreme Court, Cassa Grand claimed she was repeatedly abused, first by her father, then by the men for whom she worked as a prostitute. She came to the sex industry after leaving school in year nine and moved unsuccessfully through jobs as a waitress, process worker and factory hand. Two abusive marriages brought forth two children, son Joshua and daughter Talia, whom remained with their fathers. One of those men, she often claimed, would beat her senseless with a baseball bat and kick her in the head. Drug addiction and abuse was the defining factor of her life, ruining any chance of stability and taking a vicious toll on her long-term health. In particular, Casa Grand struggled with heart valve problems and seizures. Big hearted, generous and full of empathy for a fellow lost soul, Lillicrap opened his home to Casa Grand, vowing to aid her rehabilitation. It was a decision that did not sit well with his family, especially when, during a visit with Ron and his wife Lindsay, Casa Grand retired to their driveway to shoot up heroin. That was Joanne's downfall. After that, Lindsay said, we were worried about him, but he wanted to live his life the way he did. We tried to advise him, but he was a man of 50. You can't tell anyone of that age how to live their life. Ron said his slightly naive brother truly believed he could help Casa Grand kick her habits. He was a cross-dresser. That was the lifestyle he chose and that was his prerogative, he said. He was sort of a big bloke, but he was a sucker. He was gullible. He was lonely and eager to befriend just about anyone. Much later, Casa Grand introduced her would-be benefactor to her lesbian lover, Nicole Therese McGuinness. The women had been in a relationship for three years. Casa Grand would travel between McGuinness's residence and Lillicrap's home as her finances allowed. The couple had similarly unfortunate backgrounds. McGuinness's father left her family when she was three, exposing her to a stepfather who routinely abused her mother. McGuinness herself fell victim to rape at the age of 15. She spent her life, according to defence lawyers, either witnessing violence or being a victim of violence. She turned to drugs, they explained, to blot out the past and the present. Lindsay said the duo took advantage of her brother-in-law. They seduced him into believing he had friends and that people accepted him and wanted to be around him. We thought it would end in theft, that they'd rip him off, but we never dreamed it would end like it did. We thought we would see what was coming and knew it was going to be terrible, but not to the extent that it was. For a time, the trio lived together in Lillicrap's home. He set up a bank account for the women, keeping the pin number a secret. That way, he reasoned, their spending would be vetted by him, 
ensuring that they could not get money for drugs. It was a simplistic, overly optimistic plan that was doomed to failure from the outset. Joanne had no experience with addiction, no concept of how cunning a junkie could become to satisfy their need for drugs. His possessions and belongings began to go missing. McGuinness and Casa Grande seemed to have drugs in their room more and more often. On their visits to his family, the women became threatening and began to demand money. For Ron and Lindsay, it was the final straw. He was vulnerable and she poisoned his mind, Ron said of Casa Grande. She also stole a lot of things from him, including a video camera. They said they would trash our place if we didn't give them money. The history from then on, I do not know, because we could not allow this to happen in our home, so we had to distance ourselves from him. Little is known of the final 18 months of Joanne's life. He continued to drive trucks, volunteer for bus runs and wear dresses. He remained a regular sight around Angle Park and checked in sporadically with his community centre friends. Neighbours remember him working in his garden and that his strawberry patch was a great point of pride. Unless he was actively volunteering, however, Lillicrap kept to himself and spent his time at home with Cassegrand and McGuinness. Occasionally, rumours would surface that he was pimping out his house guests, forcing them back into prostitution to pay their way. Such claims always lacked the facts to support them. In truth, the women would travel between Adelaide and Sydney as they could afford, most often to see Cassegrand's children. In November 2001, South Australian police received word that Lillicrap was missing. Days later, they became aware Cassegrand and McGuinness were gone as well. Concerns began to mount and came to a head on the 9th of November when an anonymous caller told the triple zero operator that someone might be dead at the Norton Street house. Forensics investigators and major crime investigations branch detectives moved quickly. What they discovered was among the grisliest, most gruesome find in the state's criminal history. Human remains had been buried in the strawberry patch, but they were not whole. Officers found body fat, flesh and chunks of torso between and beneath the fruit. The deceased had been butchered either before or after he was killed and the offal left behind. On the 13th of November, police confirmed the remains belonged to Joanne Lillicrap. They continued the search for the rest of his body and appealed for help finding Cassegrand and McGuinness. They spoke of extending the search interstate and of working with police in Sydney to locate persons of interest. What they were not prepared to reveal, however, was that Cassegrand had already turned herself in at the Redfern Police Station and confessed. Distressed and dishevelled, the junkie had staggered into the police station and said she wanted to talk about a murder. Homicide detectives Robert Allison and Malcolm Lanyon led the blonde prostitute into an interview room and started to record. For more than an hour they listened as Casa Grande spoke, alternatively hysterical and chillingly calm, of slapping, torturing, smothering and stabbing a man to death. The victim, Casa Grande said, was a truck driving pro wrestler transvestite. Her accomplice was her lesbian lover and fellow prostitute. Remorse crept into her tone as she spoke of the victim's immense weight. His corpse was too heavy, she explained, to load into his own four-wheel drive for disposal. And so the women had hacked the cadaver to pieces, defleshed each segment and buried the body fat in the victim's beloved strawberry patch. Casa Grand's arrest was announced on the 15th of November and she was extradited to Adelaide. A newspaper photographer caught a glimpse of the alleged killer as she was taken away from Adelaide Airport on the 17th of November. Looking drawn and weak, dressed in a tank top and striped tracksuit pants, Casa Grand cowered behind a police officer's jacket and wept. 
She was held in the City Watch House until the 19th of November, when she made her first appearance in the Adelaide Magistrates Court. She cast an unsteady eye toward the media cameraman who filmed her arrival and had to be physically led into the courtroom by a sheriff's officer. She was remanded in custody. One day later, McGuinness was arrested. Police released few details of her apprehension and the public found out little more when she appeared in court on the 21st of November. At the request of prosecutors, Magistrate Alfio Grasso slapped suppression orders on the images of both defendants, banning the media from showing their faces to a confused public. At the time, no one outside the investigation team had any clue why Joanne Lillicrap had been murdered. On the 30th of November, Lillicrap's head and arms were found, burned almost beyond recognition in a drum at Wingfield Dump. Not only had he been butchered, he had been dismembered and decapitated. Coincidentally, the macabre discovery was made just 200 metres away from where teams were excavating for the remains of another murder victim, Japanese schoolgirl Megumi Suzuki, who was killed by escalating rapist Mark Aaron Rust. That is another case I'll be presenting soon. It was a hideous happenstance that further reinforced Adelaide's reputation as the nexus of Australia's bizarrely malicious crimes. The drum had been discovered by an employee of a concreting and restoration business. The man would never be the same again. I wished it had never been found there, he blanched, visibly distressed. We just found it there. It had nothing to do with us. We just called the police and they took it away. Cassegrand and McGuinness's appearances in court became sporadic. They did not face the Supreme Court until October 2002, at which time both pleaded not guilty to murder. Six months later, in April 2003, they fronted the court once more. This time McGuinness announced she was changing her plea and would confess to murdering Lillicrat. Cassegrand continued to protest her innocence. On the 3rd of June 2003, a near hysterical Cassegrand was brought before Justice John Perry. She began weeping the moment she entered the courtroom and mouthed messages to friends and supporters sitting in the public gallery. Her composure, however, returned instantly when she was addressed by Justice Perry. The renowned and much-loved judge and educator, who was nearing mandatory retirement, asked the woman how she intended to plead to the charge against her. Not guilty to murder, Cassegrand replied, wiping away tears, but guilty to manslaughter. The scheduled hearing date, 1st of July 2003, would see an end to the mystery surrounding Joanne Lillicrat's death. In a rare move for a South Australian judge, Justice Perry dispensed with the secrecy and released Cassegrand's court file to the media. Within the pages of documentation lay a complete transcript of the Redfern interview, and the details it provided were beyond belief. Not only did she detail every moment of the murder, Cassegrand also painted a picture of Lily Crap whom she always referred to as Joanne, or her, quite unlike that given by his family, friends and the police. I've been going to Joanne's on and off for years, and she's been coming up to my family's place for years too, Cassegrain had told the homicide detectives on the 11th of November. Joanne dobs people into social security. She's very spiteful. The last summer I was there, I stole her camera, and when I got back, she asked me where it was. I told her that I sold it for heroin in Melbourne. I told her I would get her a new one, and I wanted to leave that day, but she locked me in the house and I couldn't get out. She said later that day, her lover, Nicole, went into Joanne's bedroom and found a piece of paper with the phone number of the Footscray CIB in Melbourne. That's where I had sold the camera. The women were convinced Lillicrap intended to turn them over to interstate police because of the camera theft. Knowing he still had $600 of Cassegrain's money in the account he had created for them, the women hatched a plot to get it back and then leave Adelaide for good. 
Nicole cooked Joanne dinner and she put a couple of Rubitril in it. They're epilepsy tablets, she said. The highly potent anticonvulsant has powerful muscle relaxing properties, but also induces drowsiness and impairs the memory. The lovers felt it to be their best tool against someone larger, stronger and healthier than the two of them put together. I told Joanne I said I'll buy you a new camera and Nicole kept waving the paper in her face, saying, well, what's this? And Joanne said yes, she was going to ring the police, but she hadn't. The argument escalated. I asked Joanne for my money out of the bank, which I was saving up for my son. Nicole went into the kitchen and got a stay sharp blade. She came back into the lounge room and said to Joanne, just give us our money and we'll go. Cassagran insisted the knife was for Nicole's own protection. Lilicrap was far bigger and stronger than the women. She claimed they feared he would attack them. I don't know what happened. Joanne must have thought it was a bluff or something, but it didn't work. So it got a bit more heavy and I flipped out. I said, I just want my money, my son's money, and I'll go. I kept telling her I'd buy her another camera. Tempest flared out of control and things turned deadly. Cassagran pushed the weakened lily crap onto the lounge room floor. I was holding her, saying, why, why? I just straddled her. Nicole was in the background saying, you lying C. I had my knees on Joanne's arms. Unwilling to sit on the sidelines any longer, McGuinness attacked Lily Crap. She had the knife, Cassagrand insisted. Nicole sat on top of her and started punching her. She still had the knife in her hand and she was saying to her, just give us the money and we'll go. You know how much it means to Donna's son. She said to her, give us the effing money or you're going to die today. If you don't give it to us and let us go, I'm going to kill you. And Joanna wouldn't. She still wouldn't give it back. I don't think she ever had any intention of giving us our money back in the first place. Lilicrat began to fight back. When he couldn't shift McGuinness with the force of his bulk alone, he panicked and began to scream. Cassagran punched him in the face, breaking his nose. We were yelling and screaming, she said. And then because she was screaming, Nicole put a pillow over her face and told her to shut up. She said, just give us the pin and we'll go get the money. I'll go get the money. Donna can go get the money. Then we'll leave and everything will be all right. Lilliclap still would not cooperate and so McGuinness threw the pillow aside and began to slap him. Keeping the knife tight in her other hand, she struck repeatedly with her palm, knuckles and fingernails, cutting and scratching her victim's face. After a little bit longer of being slapped around a bit, Joanne gave us the number, Cassagrand said. Leaving McGuinness and Lilicrat behind, the junkie took her benefactor's four-wheel drive to a pub on Hanson Road in Arndale. Hands shaking, she tried the pin. It didn't work. She tried it several times, her anger increasing before giving up and returning to Norton Street. I was pissed off, she admitted. When I got back to the house, Nicole was still straddling Joanne, with a knife in her hand and the pillow over her face. And Joanne had four stab wounds in her temple, but they weren't deep. McGuinness was infuriated, she said, enraged that they had been tricked and she was no longer prepared to play games. Nicole said, see, I told you, you stupid bitch. I knew you weren't going to give Donna the right number. I knew it. Money means more to you than anything. Nicole was holding the knife up against her throat and Joanne tried to get up. Cassagrand paused in her retelling, swallowed and put her heads in her hands. Her words began to blur together. Then just bang. She stabbed Joanne right through the heart, she babbled. Nicole put the knife straight through her chest, one through her heart and four times in her stomach. There was blood coming out of Joanne's mouth. Joanne reached out and grabbed my hand. I held on to it and then it was too late. One of the detectives asked if Cassagran had tried to stop her lover's murderous actions. She admitted she had not. I was angry, she said and I was scared. 
Then Nicole looked at me, smiled and said, I can't believe that money can mean more to someone than their own life. Casa Grand said she began to panic, even though McGuinness was pretty calm. Together they dragged Lily Crap's body into the bathroom. It was Casa Grand's idea. The blood wouldn't go, she said. There were pools of blood everywhere. I washed a bit off, but I just, just kept. Her retelling broke down. There were trails of blood everywhere, she muttered. Composing herself, she continued the story. They had wrapped Lily Crap's body in a blanket and dragged him out into the backyard and onto the grass. His weight, combined with their poor health and addiction-ravaged muscles, made it impossible to lift Lily Crap. I tried to put her into the four-wheel drive, but she was too heavy. We had to get some ropes, tie her up and try to pull her over the grass to the car, and she still wouldn't move. There was no way of getting her into the car, she was too heavy. So Nicole went and got the toolbox, because there was an axe inside, and a hacksaw. The stomach-turning series of events that followed would forever immortalise the names of McGuinness, who was still carrying the knife, and Cassegrand in Adelaide's rogues gallery of hideous criminals. Nicole kneeled down next to them and looked at the hacksaw, but she said it was too blunt. So then she cut through Joanne's skin with a stay-sharp knife. Then she picked up the axe and chopped off Joanne's head. We put that in a bucket. The detective stopped Cassegrand, asking whose idea it was to dismember Lillicrap. Mine, she said, almost too softly. Then Nicole said, let me do it, because I was crying too much. Cassegrand appeared to the detectives to be completely disconnected from reality. She was lost in her story, and spoke as if someone else had perpetrated the disgusting act of human butchery. We still couldn't pick Joanne up. She was too big, she went on. So then both of her arms had to come off. And after that, she was still too heavy and so big. We tried to lift her and when that didn't work, both her legs came off at the groin. So it was just a torso left. The worst bit was the torso. She was too fat. Anyway, I got the stay sharp knife and cut all the fat off Joanne's stomach and we wrapped her back in the blanket. With their bloody work complete, their composure returned. The women became calculating. McGuinness and Cassegrand first buried Lillicrap's stomach fat in his prized strawberry patch. Then they wrapped his arms and legs in garbage bags and put them with the head in a bucket and the blanket shrouded torso in the four-wheel drive. They headed to a lake about a hundred kilometres from the city. Nicole was saying something about putting something heavy on Joanne and putting her in the water so she wouldn't float, she explained. The plan went awry when they discovered the lake was a popular fishing spot, already bustling with activity. Cassegrand said they drove into the Adelaide Hills and buried the legs and knife near the Mount Lofty Botanical Gardens. The detectives wanted to know why the women did not bury the body in one location. It probably would have been easier, Cassegrand replied. But I thought that if they found a torso, then maybe they wouldn't know who it was. Once Lillicrap's torso had been safely dumped on a beach at Port Parham, the lovers made their way back to the city. We bought some petrol and put that in the bucket with her head and arms, Cassegrand said. It was about four litres of petrol. Nicole took us to a factory at Wingfield and she went inside. She put the bucket with the head in it in this incinerator, and the arms too, and Nicole was yelling out, hurry up before someone comes. I ran over to the gate and threw her a lighter. She threw all the petrol in, and about 20 newspapers as well, and then lit it up. I keep dreaming about it, picking her head up by the hair, and putting it in the bucket. After that, Cassegrand said, the couple just drove home. I knew straight away we were going to get caught, she admitted. I knew it and I couldn't stop crying. Nicole gave me some pills so I could sleep. Then, early on the Thursday, we packed our stuff in the four-wheel drive. Their getaway plan was foiled by, of all things, a minor car accident. 
they decided to dump the vehicle and hitchhike their way to Sydney. Though she had no way of knowing for sure whether the police were looking for her, Casa Grande was pessimistic enough to believe capture was inevitable and a confession might help her score her next fix. She made a triple zero phone call from a pay phone and tried to convince the call centre to swap her confession for drugs. When that failed, she went to the police herself and with her sins revealed, she was not happy to learn methadone was not part of the deal. I wanted to get my methadone. I should have gone and got my methadone, but I've been trying to build up the courage to do this, she screamed at detectives. This is bullshit. This is effing bullshit. You effing promised me methadone. I came in here to tell the truth, not get effed around. I've got two kids that I'll never probably see again after this, and all I want is my methadone. The truth had at long last been revealed. It came as cold comfort to Ron and Lindsay Lillicrap. Under South Australian law, victims of crime are given an opportunity to tell both the court and the criminal how they have been affected in a victim impact statement. Ron and Lindsay's statements were both interrupted by hysteria and yelling from Casa Grande, who was eventually removed from the courtroom. That night, prison officials were called to the killer's cell. She had slashed both her wrists in a suicide attempt. Working quickly, officers and medical staff were able to save her life and she was kept under close watch until her next court appearance on the 17th of July. Mr Caldercott, defence for Casa Grande, was quick to inform the court of his client's suicide attempt. She is extremely contrite and remorseful as to what has happened, he said. She wasn't the person that did the killing, he reminded Justice Perry. Were she to be sentenced on the basis she had assisted McGuinness in the murder, then she would be sentenced incorrectly, a juicy point for an appeals court. In response, Justice Perry said he felt Casa Grande's true crime was unlawful and dangerous acts, including drugging and restraining Lillicrap, breaking his nose and being present when the killing took place. There is a slight air of unreality about that, he said wearily. It puts her close to the margin between manslaughter and murder. Mr Stokes for McGuinness took his turn next. His client, he said, was suffering from rampant memory loss. His claim was supported by psychological evidence suggesting the memory loss was genuine, given the murder was committed in a haze of drugs. He edged towards suggesting it was a spontaneous crime, but Justice Perry was not interested in hearing that. It was spur of the moment, but that is to be considered against the victim being forced eventually to give the pin, Justice Perry said. When news breaks that the pin is not right, the situation heats up and culminates in your client stabbing the victim in the heart. So, although I have to accept that it wasn't premeditated in the ordinary sense and was spur of the moment, it was the culmination of a relatively long period of restraining and assaulting the victim. Justice Perry remanded the lovers in custody one last time. His task was clear. Though working his way through the legal complexity of Casa Grande's involvement would require a little extra thought. Seven days were enough. The women were summoned back to court on the 24th of July for sentencing. Once they arrived, he did not mince his words. Both of you are the product of broken homes and had childhoods punctuated by violence and drug addiction, he said, as the women huddled together, their arms around one another. You have both spent substantial periods during your adult lives in jail. The effect on your psyches is evident. Casa Grande, he said, had a borderline personality disorder and depression that found expression in her suicide attempt. McGuinness shared the disorder while also suffering from impulsivity. This killing was preceded by an attempt to incapacitate the victim, who was rendered defenceless and then detained, he continued, relating the story of the pin argument. This killing was followed by the gruesome dismemberment of the body. Not only does this demonstrate the cold-blooded callousness of your conduct, 
but later had a devastating effect on the victim's family. In the gallery, Ron and Lindsay Lillicrap held each other close. Justice Perry sentenced McGuinness to life and imposed an 18-year non-parole period. It would have been 24 years, he said, if not for her admission of guilt. Casa Grant, he said, deserved a 12-year sentence, of which she must serve a minimum of 10 years. Casa Grant began to weep once more, and unusually McGuinness also started to cry. They were prized apart by sheriff's officers and led one by one back to the cells. That evening they began their long terms inside the women's prison. For Ron and Lindsay, the sentencing was the moment their healing began. Today was the first time I noticed their remorse, Ron said outside court. Crocodile tears tend to flow easily, but today I think they were finally sorry. I get some small peace of mind from that. We can finally start to find closure. John Joanne Lillicrap's remains are buried in the mid north town of Oruru with her parents. Thanks for watching and remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell to see more murder, mystery and mayhem. Until next time.